So welcome everyone, um, whoever um, is here, looks like we have some um, encouraging number at this time of the day and considering that we are just about starting, I think, um, welcome. Um, so today we are going to have a very interesting conversation around LGBTQ rights, specifically targeting the transgender community and um, some of their rights that have been trampled upon in many jurisdictions, but in particular in, the, in today's conversation, um, we are going to talk about you know um, legal systems that have seen radical um, you know changes, some radical um, rulings um, in favor of uh, the LGBT community. Um, and, and today our speaker is going to speak about a, a particular case study, which will be discussed. Um, and hopefully, and I'm looking forward to that conversation. We, as you know, this is the 13th ALC research seminar, um, which is organized monthly, but often we do it um, based on availability but also the time, the time of the year determines. Some holidays um, come across and so we skip some of them during those times. Today is the 13th and luckily we have um, a very, very prolific gender rights, human rights activist um, to speak to us on a theme um, around um, prosecution of trans feminism in Honduras. And she's gonna speak about Vicky as a case study. Uh, before we go into that, um, we will have a few, about 30 minutes of presentation. Um, there'll be a presenter, there'll be a discussant, and then you have an opportunity to ask questions. Um, and please feel free to drop in your questions into the text box when the conversation is going. Um, you can also drop your questions to the Q&A box and I'll read them out for you. If for any reason anyone wants to speak themselves, feel free to let us know. Um, text, it, type it, or raise your hand, and I'll give you the opportunity to ask the questions yourself. Um, so, I would quickly introduce our speaker, um, who is coming to speak about that Vicky um, groundbreaking ruling um, around trans rights in Honduras. Now, Gloriana, Dr. Gloriana um, Rodriguez Alvarez is a lecturer at African Leadership Center, King's College London. Um, so her academic background includes uh, an LLB in law, a master's in human rights and humanities, and a PhD in Latin American studies from the National University of Costa Rica. Um, she worked as a congressional aide for the president of the Commission on Narco Trafficking and Security in Costa Rica. In addition, she has worked for NGOs in Central America um, on programs related to human security, prison reforms, LGBTQ rights, and the protection of indigenous people within the context of plural legalism. This promises to be exciting, therefore, because of her background, but also her experience, um, in the space of active activism. When she finishes, and I'll, can you say hi, Gloriana, so people can see you on the screen before I move on to introduce Vanessa? Hi, everyone. It's fantastic, thank you. And then when she's done, um, Wadeza uh, Rukato, uh, who is a principal analyst at Sofala Partners and an ALC alumna, would respond as a discussant and give her reflections on the presentation. Now, Wadeza Rukato is a researcher and analyst working in private sector-led development focused on Africa. Outside of her job, she researches personal projects and thinks about many things, some of which include emergent LGBTQ activism and queer resistance in Africa. Um, she focuses on youth agency in African politics and many other um, contributions of young Africans um, to peace on the continent. She's an alumnus of the ALC Peace and Security and Development Fellowship, and she's based in London now. Can you say hi, Wadeza, so people can see you? Hi, everyone. Thanks for Fantastic. joining. Fantastic. Thank you. 
So um, I'll hand over to you then, um, Gloriana, to speak to us um, about what you call in the name of Vicky, prosecuting trans femicide in Honduras. So we are yours now, thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction, Clement. And so, yes, I do want to begin the presentation by saying this will be about the case of Vicky Hernandez and the first prosecution of a trans feminicide held with by an international court. So to begin with, very often in cases like this involving hate crimes, sometimes, although there may be moral outrage and there may even be widespread protest, sometimes the person at the center of the case disappears and their humanity and their individuality is not always acknowledged. So I really wanted to begin this presentation by just uh, mentioning a few personal details about Vicky Hernandez. And to begin with, she was a very young transgender woman in Honduras. And when described, people would always remember her warm almond-shaped black eyes, which she adorned with eyeliner and with mascara um, and blonde hair. She was very close to her mother and sister. And despite what was a very hard life, Vicky was both very idealistic and very defiant. In fact, she was both an activist and a leader within the transgender community. And she was promoting transgender rights through the grassroots organization, Colectivo Unidad Color Rosa, the United Pink Color Collective. So to continue, this presentation is going to be divided into three parts. First, we're gonna look at the situation of LGBTQ individuals in Honduras. We're gonna look specifically at the colonial antecedents, which continue to echo into the present day and the link between this and modern day state-sponsored transphobia. Secondly, we're gonna look at the coup of 2009 and the nexus with violence against the LGBTQ community. And third, we're gonna look specifically at the case of Vicky Hernandez, the legal antecedents, and very briefly, I promise very briefly, the legal process, and also the social repercussions, not just at the national, but at the regional context. So to begin with, we're gonna look at the situation of LGBTQ individuals. And I specifically chose this image because you have an image of a young individual and he's there protesting in what is Honduras uh, gay pride, uh, LGBTQ pride. And he's holding the LGTB flag, but he's also drip, has draped himself within the Honduran flag. And I think this really shows where the movement is right now, trying to articulate how to vindicate LGTB rights within the Honduran context. So first of all, I think it's important to begin with the beginning of the story. Uh, many of the things we will be discussing throughout the course of this presentation, such as LGBTQI discrimination, hostility, and even the persecution, these are not modern day phenomena. Rather, they go back centuries. In fact, they can be traced to the colonial social process. And in this regard, I think it's important to point out that there is evidence of both gender and sexual diversity among the pre-colonial uh, civilizations. Specifically, Stockett has looked at how there was greater gender and sexual fluidity among the pre-colonial indigenous peoples. Similarly, Peter Segal has looked at how both the Naos and the Majans had both a third gender and mixed gender identities. We also know that there was a different and varied understanding of both gender and sexuality because of the accounts from the time. Uh, there's accounts written by missionaries reporting back to Spain, and also because in an effort to stamp out this diversity, uh, Spain would implement an inquisition in both Mexico and Guatemala, which persecuted uh, individuals who engaged in same-sex practices. So in this regard, although there was a different and more diverse understanding of both gender and sexuality, the colonial process had the effect of violently imposing both a gender binary and heterosexuality. Moreover, via the legal system, these attitudes became firmly entrenched, perpetuating historical injustices. So in this sense, I also think it's very important when we're talking about challenging these uh, transphobic, homophobic attitudes to really link it to the efforts to decolonize 
Honduras, because these attitudes are rooted in that colonial process. And you could say they're one of the more, among the destructive legacies of, of the colonial era. And to this day, activists are trying to dismantle those attitudes. So as I mentioned previously, uh, many of these attitudes are one of the destructive and harmful legacies of colonialism. And they manifest in today's Honduras through state-sponsored transphobia. And this is because those discriminatory, that hostility, and even that persecution became embedded within the social, the political, and the legal sphere. As such, even the state itself upholds many of these discriminatory attitudes. And I should add that Faria uh, defines transphobia specifically as the othering of transgender, gender diverse, and other gender dissidents. And as such, it has the effect of legitimizing violence against anyone who exists beyond the gender binary. And this can be expressed in several ways. Two very clear examples in the context of Honduras would be police brutality against transgender individuals, which is frequent. And another example would be the legal erasure of transgender individuals. Previous to this ruling, there was no law that recognized the existence of transgender individuals. And I should point out that for the purposes of this presentation, I am focusing on Honduras, but this is by no means isolated to Honduras. In fact, it's a regional issue. According to the Trans Murder Monitoring Project, 82% of all documented murders of transgender individuals in the world uh, took place in Central and South America. So this is a very urgent issue. It is an issue that's written not just in blood, but it's across cemeteries. So this brings us to the second part of the presentation, the coup. And I must add what the coup entailed, this is the coup of 2009. So what caused it and what entailed it is still the subject of heated debate, it's still the topic of contention. Um, that being said, the, the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights, the European Union, and other Latin American countries all do seem to agree there is a consensus that it was a military coup. So roughly, uh, if we go by the facts that people agree on, on at 5 a.m. on June 28, 2009, the military stormed the presidential palace. They took the then sitting president, uh, Manuel Celaya, they put him on a military aircraft and they forcibly sent him into exile. What ensued was generalized chaos and military repression. And this is an image that was taken around 9 a.m. later that day. So the coup began at 5 a.m. This is around 9 a.m. And as you can see from the image, there are tanks on the street and they're throwing tear gas at the public, some of whom may know what's going on, others are finding out what's going on, but you basically have the military going out into the public. And I should add that although there was extensive military repression, uh, the Honduran public by, was by no means passive, especially uh, Celaya supporters. So I chose this image because to me, it remains one of the most compelling images uh, from that period. And what you see right there is uh, the woman with the blue shirt is one of Celaya's supporters. And she's protesting a military official who has a gun uh, pointed directly at her face. So there was remarkable bravery and there was a great deal of resistance. That being said, there was also certain, an element of paradox to the coup because in the days that followed, in the months that followed, there was widespread a military and police presence. That being said, the increased presence of security forces did not entail security for all sectors of society. Uh, in fact, for some social sectors, it had the opposite effect. And the heightened presence of security forces, in fact, resulted in extreme insecurity. And one of the social sectors who were uh, unsafe, made more unsafe by the increased presence of the security forces would be the LGBTQ community. And in the aftermath of the coup, they were profoundly affected. In fact, according to Catrachas, and this is an NGO based in Honduras, which is dedicated to both promoting and defending LGBTQ rights, just within the first month of the coup, 
15 trans feminicides occurred. In fact, Astrid Tamos, who's a lawyer for this organization, has said that what happened to the transgender community was tantamount to a social cleansing. And so this brings us to the second part of the presentation, the case of Vicky Hernandez. So I should point out that the case of Vicky Hernandez began within Honduras and it would eventually reach a regional jurisdiction. That being said, this only happened because of the tireless efforts of transgender activists, allies, human rights attorneys, and Vicky's family. In fact, the image we have that you have right now in front of you is of Rosa Hernandez, and this is Vicky's mother. And over the course of 12 years, Vicky's mother went to countless court hearings, public campaigns, and meetings with politicians and other activists in order to advocate on behalf, not just of her daughter, but of the transgender community in Honduras. So these are the facts of the case. On the 28th of June, 2009, in the evening, bear in mind the coup had begun at 5 a.m. that morning. So around 6 p.m. at night in the evening, Vicky Hernandez, Vergia Alicia, and Michelle Torres were all working in the streets and they were all working in the informal economy. So they were uh, dependent on what work they were able to do on a day-to-day -day basis. A strong police presence and a strong military presence patrolled the streets. And Vicky, Fergie, and Michelle were all spotted by a police unit that tried to arrest them. Bear in mind, these three individuals were all transgender women. And as such, they had most likely been subjected to police harassment and police brutality previous to this day. Um, it's worth noting that Red La Trans did a region-wide survey just focusing on police brutality and the transgender community. And they asked one question, you know, have you ever been subjected to police brutality? And it should be noted that depending on the country, anywhere from 80 to 90% of transgender individuals stated that they had in fact been subjected to police brutality. So these three women, the moment they spotted the police unit, they ran in opposite directions, which was a strategy frequently used by the transgender individuals in, Guate in Honduras when they were targeted by the police officers. Now the next day, Vicky was found dead. She was merely 26 years old. One month later, Fergie was killed in 2011 Michelle was also killed. So in response to the targeting of transgender women, such as Vicky, Fergie, and Michelle, activists in Latin America created the term transfeminicide. And this specifically refers to the murder of a transgender woman because of her or their gender identity. And the Brazilian activist Bento points out that it is due to a widespread policy based on the systemic elimination of gender diverse and transgender women. Moreover, in her research, Bentos points out that the individuals who are most likely to be targeted for trans femicide are leaders and very vocal activists within the transgender community. She goes so far as to say, in many ways, this is almost a punishment for individuals who dare uh, request recognition from social institutions. And I should add that in Honduras, you know, to make matters worse, there's an impunity rate of 90%. So in this regard, the persecution of transgender communities has long been upheld by the judicial system. So the following is a timeline of the case of Vicky Hernandez. Um, I should point out that Vicky Hernandez is murdered in 2009. And initially her family, her lawyers and her community did want the case to be held within the Honduran national jurisdiction. That being said, due to state inaction and the lack of due diligence in investigating her case. In 2012, Catrachas, which is the NGO dedicated to promoting LGBTQ rights, filed an initial petition within the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. And here I'll briefly explain how the re Inter-American Regional System for Human Rights works. So basically it's foreseen, it's designed as a court of last resort. 
Ideally, within the inter-American system, if there's a human right violation, it's addressed at the national level. That being said, if there's a delay in the administration of justice, if there's a miscarriage of justice, the inter-American court exists to try to remedy it. That being said, there's still a series of procedures that have to be followed. So first, the person has to lodge a complaint within the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Then the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights carries out an investigation. And if they think there's been a human rights violation, they list a series of recommendations for the state to follow in order to correct, to remedy that injustice. If the state does not abide by the recommendations or fails to uphold the standard established by the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, then the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights submits the case to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. And this is essentially what happened. In 2018, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights issued the report. When the Honduran state did not respond adequately, they submitted the case to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. The following year, a public hearing was held. And then in 2021, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights released what became a landmark verdict when they found a state responsible for the death of Vicky Hernandez, for the death of a transgender woman. So Vicky's case is landmark for several reasons. First of all, because it established the role of state responsibility in her death. And I should point out that this is in part because the legal strategy used by Vicky's team involved affirming Vicky's humanity by establishing the state's obligation to recognize her identity and her right to life. I should point out um, the legal obligation to recognize her identity had procedural consequences. Um, during the trial held within the national jurisdiction, Vicky had been misgendered. She had often been referred to by different names. And so that was one thing that her team said, you know, no, this can't be done. If someone has said they're transgender, we have to respect their gender identity. Secondly, uh, her right to life is also because the state did enact with due diligence, both when investigating the case and when prosecuting the case. Now, establishing state responsibility for Vicky's death was also fundamental because both her team and activists wanted to establish that there was a prevalence of institutional transphobia. One of the things that they were adamant was in establishing that this was not an isolated case. In fact, they wanted to demonstrate that what happened to Vicky happened within a larger pattern of violence against transgender and gender diverse individuals. Now, this case was also landmark because it established that transgender women are women. And again, this was also part of the legal strategy used by Vicky's team. In effect, they wanted to affirm her humanity by having the court acknowledge her womanhood. And they said, uh, to acknowledge someone's humanity, you have to acknowledge the completeness of their existence. You can't expect people to lead these fragmented lives, which is what often has happened, not just to Vicky, but to other members of the LGBTQI community. Now, in order to achieve this, her team decided that they would say that the regional treaties that touch on the issue of gender-based violence apply to this case. Now, the most famous of these is the Convention of Belém do Pará. And I should point out that prior to this case, this convention had only been used to defend cisgender women from gender-based violence. So Vicky's team argued that Vicky's death happened within a framework of gender-based violence because she was targeted because of, her because of her gender identity. And on that note, the court agreed with her, with her lawyer's argument. And they said, yes, the convention of Belém do Pará applies because the violence against transgender individuals is based on their gender identity. And as such, it constitutes gender-based violence. And what is equally important is that in the verdict, the court established that the Honduran state had violated the Convention of Belém do Pará by not protecting Vicky from gender-based violence. So overall, this is a landmark sentence amidst a context of relentless structural violence going back centuries. 
And I should highlight, it's not impossible to emphasize this enough, that it is an achievement earned through the perseverance by transgender activists, by lawyers, allies, and Vicky's family. That being said, I want to emphasize that this is not the end of the story. It is not even the beginning of the story of transgender and gender diverse individuals in Honduras. As we've seen from this presentation, there's documented, it has been documented that transgender and gender diverse individuals have existed for centuries. E equally worrying is the fact that transphobia, homophobia, and some of these discriminatory attitudes also go back centuries. They're one of the destructive legacies of colonialism. So in this regard, what happened right now is neither the beginning nor the end of the story of transgender and gender diverse individuals. In many ways, this verdict, what it is a new chapter in the story of gender diverse and transgender individuals. And what it signals is the beginning of accountability within the state context. That being said, the fight is far from over. It is still necessary to reframe the social, the political, and the legal theater to promote more rights and decolonize it a bit further so we can create more space to acknowledge the humanity and the dreams of the transgender community. Thank you. That is breathtaking, uh, Gloriana. Thanks so much. Um, I mean, basically what you've done uh, is to uh, position the conversation in a decolonial con context. Uh, so you say decolonize and humanize, um, which I think um, should be a, a key takeaway for us when if, if for nothing at all um, in, in, in this conversation of the um, LGBT and hate crimes against people of uh, who are different from us. Um, without going into too much details, noting that um, Wadeza is here to give us that critical reflection. I would hand over to you now, Wadeza, and then please keep your questions coming um, if you have questions. I think one question is in already, but um, just as a reminder that please ask your questions if you have any whilst we listen to Wadeza. So please, we are yours now. Wadeza. Thank you so much, Clement. Um, and thank you so much, Gloriana. Um, it was, yeah, a real, I think, joy, and as Clement said, breathtaking to read um, the paper that you co-authored and to learn of, of Vicky's story and, and this case, which I had not known about before and, yeah, felt just really, really seminal. Um, I'm going to read just the last line of the abstract um, again, because when I, when I read the paper for the first time, I found it really striking. Um, and so it reads, as Gloriana had, had mentioned just now, 12 years after Vicky was killed, a legal precedent was established when the Inter-American Court of Human Rights found a state responsible for the death of a transgender woman for the first time in history, affirming that transgender women are women and are entitled to gendered legal protection. Um, and I think that really just kind of requires repeating and repeating and repeating, especially I think in the current context, um, and in the current context, I think when we're seeing uh, an incredible backlash against trans rights um, in many countries, I think that are considered to be quite liberal and, and expected to, to potentially be supportive of trans, of trans rights, including the US, the, the very UK that we're in right now. Um, and I, yeah, I found that really striking and really moving. Um, in terms of the structure of, of my response, um, I'll spend about five minutes kind of just providing some thoughts that came to mind when I read the paper um, and listening to your presentation just now, Gloriana. Um, I'll then spend a couple of minutes kind of discussing and providing an overview of the legislative landscape um, that primarily kind of curtails LGBTQ plus rights in African countries and in some rare cases um, makes room and promotes it. And um, the focus on Africa is just based on my own kind of research interests, my lived experience um, and the kind of region that I prim primarily look at. Um, and then after that, I'll kind of close with a couple of questions to Gloriana that hopefully won't supersede some of the questions that I'm hoping everyone is kind of planning to share as we go along. 
Um, Again, the kind of framing of my of my response um, in this conversation is based on things that I think about generally, um, based on again my interest in in LGBT, LGBTQ plus rights and activism in in African countries and the role of of African youth and kind of pushing and growing an emergent um, LGBTQ plus rights movement on the continent. Um, so again, I think, you know, when I first read the paper, the first thing that came to mind is what feels like a deeply contentious debate around trans rights. Um, I think largely in, in, in the US and the UK at the moment, but, but generally more broadly, I think even in, in popular culture. Um, and the, I think the choice of this, this paper and this topic for the, for the seminar felt really fitting because of that. Um, and the, the outcome of the legislative process related to Vicky's case, again, felt particularly seminal given what feels like um, the kind of regression of like small, I guess like small but important progress that was made around kind of trans visibility in countries again like the UK and and the US um, and and what is and what is deeply contrasted um, with um, you know high rates of of trans murder um, in the US and the particular targeting of of black trans um, women in the US and of course then the debate around um, kind of gender affirming. Um, uh, healthcare in the UK um, as well, and and so yeah, felt felt incredibly fitting. Um, again, you know, was really struck by what felt like a huge victory in terms of the outcome of the of the legislative process. Something that I, you know, probably wouldn't have expected, um, and and haven't seen elsewhere. And this feeling that Vicky's case is one that should just be known a lot more about um, and definitely raise questions around what the visibility of this case is um, and how more people can can know about it. Um, but it also made me think of, you know, kind of, I think a line that um, trans activists often often repeat and kind of try to 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 raise the profile of which is that trans rights and the kind of um, status of trans rights matters for all rights and the rights of, of, of all marginalized people. And I think you you kind of touched on this in the paper where you, I think, compared a statistic around the rates of trans femicide in Honduras um, and the, the really, really high rates of, of femicide, um, of, of you know, the, the kind of murder of, of cishet and um, cisgender women with impunity. And I think really important that we can't delink um, uh, the kind of, in, you know, I think suppression murder of trans trans people from the suppression murder and abuse of of other communities, whether it be kind of black women or or other marginalized groups. And I think really important to like link those two things in any conversations we have around um, the importance of trans rights. Um, I think also in your paper you mentioned that at some point the the ruling was kind of endorsed and supported by the, the, the president in Honduras. Um, and I'm hoping that you might find some time to discuss that later, but again, found that to be, yeah, really just like interesting, specifically given my kind of focus on um, LGBTQ plus rights in African countries and, and the, the deep role of heads of states, presidents in, in, I think, leading discourses that result in the oppression of LGBTQ plus communities. And we've seen that recently in Uganda, we're seeing it in Kenya as well. Um, and so found that really, really interesting and really striking and, and quite rare as well, especially in a country again, with entrenched kind of systematic and, and state led um, homophobia and transphobia. Um, moving into kind of the you know the the offering on on my part in this discussion. What it will really focus on is the status of um, LGBTQ plus rights and legislation in African countries. Really, just kind of providing an overview of that, um, linking it to the colonial legacies that uh, Gloriana touched on in her discussion. Um, I'll then kind of end with, um, or rather, move into. A, a reflection around uh, questions of visibility, which I think um, Gloriana touches on as well in the paper, um, kind of linking questions around visibility to the erasure of um, 
gender non-conforming people um, through the colonial kind of lawmaking process, but also um, I think the ways that visibility or invisibility might be co-opted by LGBTQ plus communities as a kind of survival tactic and kind of thinking around those tensions. Um, and then I'll briefly touch on um, some reflections around um, queer resistance and, and some of the ways that I kind of see it manifesting in, in African countries, um, yeah, that I think we should all kind of know about. Um, so I'll share my screen. I've got two kind of short slides, which I'll keep up um, as, I, as I speak. Um, so the slide that I've shared up there essentially is provides a, an overview of the um, status of legislation criminalizing um, homosexuality in African countries. It is updated as of 2020, but I think really kind of just paints an, a helpful picture to understand the, the kind of deep, deep um, kind of state endorsed, state led homophobia that exists across most African countries. Um, I think in terms of, you know, in terms of thinking around where this comes from, as, as Gloriana mentioned, um, there, there's a deep kind of colonial history that um, informs uh, homosexuality, um, rather homophobia um, in African countries. The British in particular were notorious for introducing laws um, that um, kind of criminalized what they called carnal intercourse against the order of nature with any man, woman, or animal. And really this was kind of um, the introduction of laws that punished um, consensual sex amongst um, same, consensual sex, same sex, consensual um, sexual relations amongst um, um, adults of the same sex, often with either death or imprisonment. And we see that really carrying through into a lot of the laws that still exist in African countries, the kind of emergence into a post-independence era um, in the absence of questioning these laws, their relevance and um, the harm that they cause. Um, and really, I think what we see across a number of, of African countries is that the, the laws criminalizing homosexuality, um, gender queerness, really reflect the Judeo-Christian colonial values that were introduced at the onset of colonialism, which continue to define how um, LGBTQ plus communities in a number of countries can kind of exist um, and how the, the law treats them. In terms of a kind of overview of, in terms of thinking about the role of the state in either curtailing or providing room for LGBTQ plus rights in African countries, I wanted to read um, two, two extracts. So one is from a book called Sexuality and Social Justice in Africa. This is what the cover looks like. Um, it's written by a historian called Mark Eprecht. Um, I want to disclaim that this is not my kind of choice for, for reading on, on kind of African, you know, the, the status and, and lives and, and rights of African um, LGBTQ plus communities. Um, I think there's more compelling work that's been produced by uh, queer Africans themselves and, and African um, scholars, but I think um, the line that I'm going to read is helpful for kind of just contextualizing uh, the current status quo. Um, and so at the start of a chapter called Sex and the State, um, Eprecht writes, for most African LGBTQ plus people today, the state is an enemy. Its police harass and extort from them. Its media slanders them. Its institutions block their attempts to organize and its po politicians organize vigilantism against them. Yet the African state will be important to challenging cultural attitudes and facilitating the, the achievement of sexual, sexual rights and gender, gender justice. And I, I found this line or I guess extract quite helpful for linking what felt like the important highlighting of um, legislation and laws and victories at that level for securing um, rights for LGBTQ plus communities. And, and in the case of the, the paper and the case that she presented, Gloriana, um, trans um, people, specifically because I think what we see um, in a number of African countries outside of a few cases where um, uh, there have been kind of legal victories for LGBTQ plus people in the absence of, of legislation. I think 
um, emergent and existing queer rights movements will continue to struggle to kind of secure some of the, the core structural um, elements that are required for, for accessing basic kind of services, but really for being able to access human rights. Um, and I think the case of Vicky is really, really important for for demonstrating the fact that alongside you know the the power of activist movements there is a role that the state plays in either institutionalizing homophobia transphobia queerphobia and there there is room for i think great victory where legislation um kind of lands in favor of of queer lgbtq plus and trans rights um again kind of continuing on this overview of of the status of of uh, LGBTQ plus rights on the continent. I think South Africa remains a kind of seminal case where um, LGBTQ plus rights are enshrined in the constitution. And since 2006, um, uh, marriage, you know, I guess gay marriage, queer marriage was, was um, allowed. And I think South Africa is the only case um, on the continent where this, where this is the case. More recently in 2019 in Botswana and in Angola, um, homosexuality and same-sex relationships were decriminalized. And, and these were, I think, huge victories for the LGBTQ plus community um, across the continent. But at the same time, we're seeing, I think, quite stark regressions in um, LGBTQ plus rights, specifically in countries such as Ghana, which is in the process of considering a really draconian deeply kind of oppressive um, anti-homosexuality anti law, as well as Uganda, which in the last kind of couple of months has introduced a law that is kind of in the parliamentary review process um, that seeks to also criminalize um, uh, same-sex relations and homosexuality. And so, you know, I think the broad picture is, is one of kind of deeply repressive laws um, some instances of, I think, progress and hope um, in the in the midst of um, a regression um, of of rights in a number of countries. I now want to move on to kind of discussing questions or reflections around visibility and the tensions that it provides um, or that that it that it raises. Um, and to do this, I kind of want to raise um, a recent case in Kenya. Um, where uh, the Supreme Court um, issued a ruling which allowed the National Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission to register as an NGO following a previous ban on the registration of this um, commission. Um, when the verdict was handed down, this was a massive victory for the LGBTQ plus community in Kenya um, for a number of reasons. But what we saw quite soon after that was that the visibility that um, the, the court ruling then kind of resulted in led to a backlash against the LGBTQ plus community. And this kind of, you know, in, emerged at the, the most senior level in government where the president um, kind of said, you know, we accept the court's ruling, but we don't have to agree with it. A number of um, Kenyan politicians and political leaders, both on social media and in public, um, denounced the LGBTQ plus community. And I think what this case really highlighted was, you know, this idea that alongside this massive legal victory for the LGBTQ plus community came um, I guess what was quite like a dangerous backlash against the community and I think really highlighted the tensions that exist around um, the importance of, of progress that visit legal progress that visibilizes um, the LGBTQ plus community in Kenya and the dangers um, that can kind of emerge from that as well and I think really highlights the fact that progress will be tensioned at all moments. Things that will be victories might also emerge as immediate risks to the community. And I think, yeah, it's, it's just something to kind of keep in mind as, as a number of, of LGBTQ plus communities across the continent continue to push for rights and legally enshrined rights. I think also around visibility, interesting questions have, have kind of emerged from my own conversations with, um, you know, fellow Africans around um, queerness in, in African countries. And like you said, uh, Gloriana, in the same same, same cases as Honduras, where uh, queerness existed before colonialism and was part of the ways that communities lived and kind of 
you know, we're in relation to one another. And that is the same for, for African societies and African communities. And what we see kind of post this, you know, post the kind of interaction of colonialism with African countries is that people feel, sometimes feel quite comfortable being, you know, admitting that, um, queerness is has been part of their communities forever but there's on often a kind of disclaimer that says as long as you are quiet as long as you are not loud as long as you're not kind of flaunting your queerness it can work people saying you know i've got a, i've got a cousin who i grew up with who we always knew was queer but it was acceptable because he was not too loud about it um and so alongside that kind of visibility question as it relates to the kind of legislative um piece I think there are also interesting questions around visibility, visibility, invisibility um, as a kind of survival tactic, um, the ability to survive because of being invisible um, versus the kind of fight for visibility that we see in the kind of fight for LGBTQ plus rights more broadly. Um, and then to kind of tail off, I wanted to briefly touch on questions around resistance, which I find really, really juicy. And I think um, really want to focus on the ways that uh, African youth are carving out space for kind of building queer rights movements alongside um, other, other rights, broader kind of human rights movements. And I think a good example for, uh, that illustrated this um, was the NSARS protests, which were, you know, led by Nigerian youth um, in protest against kind of wide ranging impunity by the, um, uh, I guess, SARS. Um, so this kind of police force that would abuse, kill, and, and um, I guess, you know, yeah, abuse and kill Nigerians, often young Nigerians, um, with really the, the kind of consent of the state. Um, and so alongside this movement to have um, this kind of uh, police unit disbanded, we saw young queer Nigerians using the, the, the protests as a platform to advocate for queer rights. Um, and this kind of live protest movement was um, supported by an online movement that um, was, was made visible using hashtags that said queer Nigerian lives matter. If we're talking about all Nigerian lives matter, mattering queer Nigerian lives uh, should be kind of actively considered amongst this. Um, and so I think really interesting things happening in, in Nigeria, in Ghana, in, in Kenya, in in Uganda um, that that demonstrate that as um, governments try to crack down on LGBTQ plus communities, young Africans are equally mobilizing both domestically and across the continent to make sure that their voices are heard. Um, and I think in, in efforts to build um, both domestic and, and regional movements that will um, raise the importance of LGBTQ plus rights um, where this is currently not the case. Um, I think another kind of site of resistance that I find quite meaningful is um, writing and literature and arts. Um, and here I have kind of shared the, the book covers of four books that I have both read and, and deeply enjoyed that both um, kind of work to decolonize queer sexualities in African countries. Um, and I guess, like, you know, I guess like the, the two on the three on the right are specifically by Nigerian authors. And so, you know, they do this work within a Nigerian context. The one on the left speaks more broadly to a number of short stories that speaks to that speak to queer, queer lived, queer existences, queer joys, queer kind of lives across a number of other African countries. But I think literature, arts and culture are an important site of resistance. Um, and, and I think an important site of, of archiving um, and locating queer identities within African cosmologies, which, which is, yeah, I think interesting and important to be engaging with. I guess then to kind of end off, uh, Gloriana, I have written down three questions, which um, it would be great if you could consider if, if you have time and in relation to other questions that have been asked. And the first is, um, how are the implications of the ruling um, in Vicky's case kind of being seen in on the ground since the verdict was handed down? Um, has the ruling created room for more visible manifestations of trans joy in Honduras? Uh, the second question is, 
was there any societal pushback against the ruling? So earlier I kind of flagged having read the paper that um, the head of state of the time kind of spoke to, endorsed and seemed supportive of, of the verdict. Um, what was the kind of position of society um, around it? And the third question is, what is the status of trans rights and LGBTQ plus rights um, activism in Honduras? And, and um, how else has the impact of the key story been documented and archived in relation to this? Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, that's wonderful. Um, very good, uh, invigorating re response from you as well, Wadeza. Um, I mean, some of those questions you asked, brilliant. I also, you know, have been asked by people, but I'll allow um, um, Gloriana to respond to yours, um, and then, you know, we can come back to you. The others, uh, the rest in, in in the chat box. So thanks so much, and um, please keep your questions coming, everyone. Very many good questions, uh, wonderful. So you have a lot on your hands today, Gloriana. But please um, start with Radeza. So thank you so much for your comments. They're always so thought provoking and insightful. Um, so to begin with, um, wh what is the state of transgender rights in Honduras right now? So the sitting president, uh, Xiomara Castro, did say that Honduras would recognize the ruling and would take measures to implement the, all, all of the things that the Inter-American Court said they had to do. So for example, now there is a transgender identity. There's a law recognizing the transgender identity. So that's a very important triumph. Um, in Honduras. The other thing is there's a national ID card that they have. And up until, you know, to 2021, um, transgender individuals wouldn't be able to take their photograph the way they live. They had to do it, you know. So now they can, their national ID says their name, it, they can, and they can uh, take photographs as they are. So that would, so there's been at, at a procedural level, there have been changes. Um, the other interesting point I want to make is that when they asked for the set, when they were doing the court case, Vicky's lawyers didn't just ask for justice. They also said, we want reparations for the transgender community. So they wanted a series of scholarships because they said, well, part of the vulnerability of the transgender community stems from the lack of access to education and the lack of access to dignified work. So the legal strategy was quite intersectional. Um, on that, the state has been slower. There should be a scholarship fund. And you know, if they were implementing everything in accordance with this ruling, there should be a scholarship fund. That hasn't fully happened. And the other thing that her team asked that the court accept, accepted was that they wanted a documentary about the lives of Honduran gender diverse and transgender individuals. And they said, this is a way to increase the visibility and to increase sensitivity and to make the public aware that we exist, that we have a right to exist. Um, so in principle, the state has agreed to do both, the scholarships and the documentary. In the praxis, what has happened is, yes, they have passed the law and they have done uh, procedures to recognize transgender identities, but the other more intersectional measures, I think they're, they have been somewhat lacking. Um, the other thing that I should point out that in Honduras right now, like some other Latin American countries, there is a backlash. So I think that backlash that you've mentioned that is happening in the United States, is happening in the United Kingdom, is also happening in some Latin American countries. Um, and it's often with from the religious sectors, especially you have from a lot of neo Pentecostal, but also from some Catholic groups that will say, no, this is an ideology, or they, they just reject the very existence of transgender individuals. And in some countries, it has become a political issue. So we have to see what happens in the elections. Uh, Honduras hasn't had elections yet, but we have to see if it becomes an electoral issue. It has been in other countries. So there, um, as, as one transgender activist I spoke to said, you know, yes, there's progress, but we're walking across a tightrope and we're walking very carefully across what is a treacherous path. Um, that being said, I think the ruling for the transgender community, not just in Honduras, but across the region, there was a great deal of excitement. And here I should point out that when the Inter-American Court did its ruling, it was binding not just for Honduras, but also for all countries that are signatories 
of the Convention of San Jose, which recognizes the authority of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. So right now, all the Latin American countries that have recognized the Inter-American Court of Human Rights should have laws on the books acknowledging transgender identities, establishing procedures so that transgender identities can be recognized that are of no cost to the transgender individual. And there should be scholarships and public awareness campaigns. Um, that being said, it depends on the country whether or not that has happened. I can tell you, for example, in my own country, we do have a transgender identity law. But for instance, in Guatemala and Nicaragua, that isn't the case. So the picture is, is complex. and It depends a lot which country we are uh, we, we're, we're talking about. Uh, the other point I wanted to say when you talk about, when you mentioned transgender joy or spaces to celebrate transgender identity, um, I should point out that one of the things that really struck me is uh, there's this uh, Costa Rican poet who makes a point of saying how if you're from a marginalized identity, sometimes the act of resistance comes by just being beautiful. He always says that. And he always says that um, when when a space is denied to us in this one, in this world, we create imaginary worlds that are governed by beauty and not cruelty. And he goes, and when this world tries to wipe me away, I celebrate, I scream, and I sing in other worlds. So I think that's something that I, I always find it very melodic and very poetic. So I, I just wanted to share that, yeah. Fabulous, thanks so much. Um... Wekesa, uh, Wedeza and um, Gloriana for all those um, important reflections. And I think, um, did you want to respond at all to anything, Wedeza? No. Okay, no. fabulous, thank you. Um, so uh, there's been quite a number of compliments and questions and most of what have come in are compliments and it, it's important, it's, it's just refreshing to see some of those thoughts around, I mean, there was a question which has been responded uh, to already um, for you to reflect on um, how things have changed post the the ruling in communities. And I think that aligned with the question that we, we Desa asked. So if you want, if you still want to pick it up at some point, you can, you'd have opportunity to reflect on that further. Um, there was also um, some comments around the fact that gay identity existed post pre-colonialism, which you've alluded to already um, from uh, Ahmed, he gave example of um, King Mwanga II um, in Uganda, which is good. It complements the point you made. Um, there were also reflections on how significant, how important this whole conversation is that highlights the, the role that the state can play in destroying, but also building things and also suppressing individual rights. Um, you touched on that. If you want to reflect on that at some point, that's fine. But there are a few questions which I think, um, you know, uh, in addition to the compliments, you may want to look at. And I'll ask them one by one if that's okay. Um, so you'd have time to respond to them. Um, so um, Munya has criticized the AU um, he thinks the AU, for instance, is very lame uh, as a duck, as an institution. And I guess the point he's making is that the setting up of continental court in Africa on human rights might just be another creation of an organ, which won't have any power uh, to compel individual uh, states to act. And I guess he's, speaking, he's saying this in context of what has happened in, Amer in Latin America, where the transnational institution was able to take up um, this, you know, individual case. Do you think there's scope for this in Africa, for instance? So I think I would begin by answering that question. Um, the issue with law and with international law included mm -hmm. is that it is never neutral. You mm -hmm. know? I would say this verdict, um, we got this verdict in part because of the composition of the court. And I would say not, this wasn't a unanimous verdict. There was actually a, a very prominent uh, women, a judge who it happens to be a woman and has been a prominent feminist who um, was not, didn't agree, for example, with extending the convention of Belém do Pará uh, to Vicky Hernández. So even this ruling was contested. There was uh, dissent within the court. 
And I think I, we can also look at the what's happening now in the United States. That the Supreme Court is reaching certain decisions because the composition of the court has changed. So I think my answer to that would be twofold. One, the issue with regional and international jurisdictions is that they require the states to be party to that jurisdiction. For example, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, um, I can tell you the United States is not party to that specific uh, jurisdiction. It's not party to the, you know, um, Honduras did accept the jurisdiction of that court. Uh, my country, Costa Rica, has accepted the jurisdiction of that court. So that's one issue that sometimes the countries that are the, you could say, um, where there are, there may be human rights violations, but they don't necessarily accept the jurisdiction. So that's the first obstacle. And then the second obstacle is that even when there's a verdict, you know, even when the Inter-American Court says there was a human rights violation in this case, the president or the state doesn't always accept the verdict. Honduras happens to have its first female president right now. So Xiomara Castro happens to be the first woman who was elected president in Honduras. Um, she is also, this is the other tidbit, she's also the wife of Manuel Celaya. So the president that was overthrown in the coup, um, 10 years later, his wife ran for the presidency and she won. So you can say there's a lot of factors, you know, psychological factors, ideological factors that went, that made her more willing to accept this very progressive ruling. Um, and that's not always the case. So whether we're talking about Latin America or Africa or Europe, which also has a, a human rights tribunal, um, states don't always agree. I can think of the European Tribunal of Human Rights that has had verdicts uh, that are very, that um, acknowledge the rights of refugees, and yet many European member states don't uphold the human rights standard. So I would say it's a case-by-case -case basis. I think regional and international jurisdictions are important because they can be an instrument for activists to try to promote their rights in some cases. Again, that being said, it varies uh, depending on the context. Mm. So... I would say that if you're an activist, and I guess I put myself in that uh, within that group, um, you have an arsenal and you're seeing, okay, what works in this context? Is it the regional court? Is it the national court? Is it a public campaign? Is it poetry? Is it protesting out in the street? Or is it maybe hiding? Because right now, maybe that's what's best. And I think that it's not an answer I can give. It's going to be very context specific. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah that, that that's very good reflection there. And I mean, some... Um, yeah, I mean, they, they talk about continental, regional, and then uh, national legal systems. It's very important. And I'm happy that you've tried to, you know, bring discuss the pros and cons of each of them. Um, there was a question about COVID-19 and whether you think that in spite of the progress that was made in Honduras, you know, in the case of Vicky, whether COVID added anything at all um, to that uh, momentum in terms of um, shifting allegiances, making things better, or regressing issues in Honduras? COVID-19, did it make any impact at all and how? Well, I think to answer that question, I, I would say it's very important to take an intersectional lens when analyzing things like transgender rights or women's rights, you know, um, and it's never just about gender, it's always gender, class, race. So in that sense, what COVID did was it, it made it much harder for the community. Uh, most transgender individuals work in the informal economy. It depends, you know, what part they're from, what type of work they do. And they don't have the same family support that maybe other individuals would so for COVID, for a lot of people in Latin America, especially those who may have been working in the informal sector, they could have relied on the family to help them out. Uh, this wasn't necessarily an option for the transgender community. So I think, for it, again, depending what country we're in, uh, the outcome varied, but it has been a very tough time because, again, I, here I'm talking about uh, the right to life, the right to identity. But I think we also have to bear in mind uh, human rights include social and economic rights. And on that note, life has become very tough for transgender individuals. Uh, the countries were affected 
by COVID because of the, for economic reasons, a lot of countries in Latin America, and now with the Ukraine, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, that economic hardship, which already existed, um, has been aggravated. Fabulous. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I, that, just in relation to that, I, I think that um, the intersectionality of identity comes into the question, and someone is asking you whether um, race and class have any impact at all on uh, trans femi trans femicide um, or hatred towards LGBT people. Um, yeah, just the person is curious, and I think that's Natasha. And the previous question was from Kerry, by the way. This is from Natasha asking whether uh, class uh, or race had any impact at all, or has any impact at all on this. I think one of the things, um, because you know, I have worked with this community uh, in both in, in several uh, Central American countries. So off the top of my head, I would say that yes, you can never separate transgender identity from the rest of the social picture from identities related to race, uh, class, gender, and even a religious affiliation can play a role, migration status as well. Um, so off the top of my head, one of the things I can think of is the fact that in many countries, for example, gender affirming surgeries are not necessarily covered by health insurance. Hmm. So just that alone for transgender individuals who may want to have a gender affirming surgery, uh, many, some of them have endangered their lives because they don't go to doctors that are specialized. They may go to, you know, they may go to third parties. So there's that, you know, so some of them endanger their lives. And this is specifically um, transgender individuals who don't have access, who can't just pay it out of pocket. So that's one way it changes. Um, the other thing is access to education. If you're middle class or middle upper class, the whole paradigm changes. Um, transgender individuals are gonna face some of the same challenges that other working class individuals would face. So they, don't, they might not have access to the best education. They might not have access to the best work, to dignified work. So in that sense, the, what their identity as a trans person exacerbates these other social vulnerabilities. Um, I think it is worth noting that Vicky Hernandez herself came from a working class background and she was working in the informal sector and her mother was as well. So, you know, she, she was targeted for trans feminist side because she was out in the street. You know, if she had had access to education and access to dignified work, uh, white collar work, she might have been working for, from home the way many professionals were, and she wouldn't have had to endanger her life to make you know, a bit of money so she could eat that day. So I would say trans femicide is very much not just a gender issue, it's a class issue and it's a race issue as well. Um, throughout this presentation, I even said, I made a point of saying transgender and gender diverse. And that's because Latin America, Honduras is a very diverse country. You know, you have uh, Latin Americans who identify as indigenous and with indigenous, you have several different groups. Uh, you have uh, Hondurans who identify as black, you have Hondurans who identify as white, you have Hondurans who identify as Asians and Hondurans who identify as mixed. So it's a very racially and ethnic diverse country. Uh, and not all of them use the term transgender. Uh, transgender tends to be more used by urban Honduran individuals, but when you interact with uh, individuals who are from rural areas or who are from in, in indigenous people, some of them actually reject that term because they're like, no, that's very urban or that's very Western. So they'll use gender diverse or gender dissident, or they may have other specific terms. So in that sense, yeah, this can't be separated from race, ethnicity, and class. Fabulous. And really, that's a very good point you touched on in terms of uh, what you know, Shuvai is calling um, self-naming. Um, so there's a question for both of you about how we define all these things. You know, people call themselves one thing. The state refers to them in another way. And so the specific question I would like to read because it's long, but the idea um, is that how does self-naming or identification of trans or LGBT community influence this whole conversation? But I'll read specifically the question. She said, um, I found in the paper quite fascinating the tension or conflict between self-naming or identity of transgender communities versus the naming and assigning of identity by either the state 
the rest of society, or even um, in this case, a regional system. What gets lost or distorted in this instance? Um, and so that, that and this to you, to both of you. So maybe um, just for you to take your breath, Gloriana. With this, do you want to? With this, do you want to start this? Uh, responding to this question. Yes, I can. I can absolutely start. Um, Thank you. I think maybe just in the the reading of the question. So my understanding of the naming and assigning of identity by either the state, um, the rest of society, or a regional system. My my reading of that is the degree to which um, any of these kind of institutions or entities or structures either agree or disagree with the kind of um, identity that one um, announces themselves as, the one the identity that one names themselves as. Um, and in terms of, I guess the question is like, what, what gets lost or distorted in this instance? Um, Hmm. I might need to think about that because my immediate response was going to kind of be to reflect on what might be gained um, where there is a kind of affirmation. Um, and I guess that's kind of what we, we learned about in the case of Vicky. And, and the immediate kind of thing that comes to mind is um, the ability to kind of have state structures um, recognize one, you know, a, a trans identity um, enables, like what Gloriana said, the ability to kind of exist in physical spaces um, as you are. So to, to go and get your ID photo taken and to not need to um, present as um, different than, than what you are, which I think is, is deeply radical and important. You know, the, the flip side of that is, is I think, you know, a quite accessible case is the arrest of trans people um, and their kind of um, holding in um, cells with um, individuals of the opposite gender and the kind of physical risks, uh, the, the kind of stripping of dignity that emerges in cases like that. Um, at a more kind of basic level where there is that kind of affirmation and alignment, I think it you know, really enables um, trans people to be able to access basic services. So healthcare, um, you know, education, the ability to apply for a job where you can present as your actual identity on your CV and none of those things are questioned. Um, the ability to access public spaces like bathrooms where you can enter a bathroom as a, as a trans woman and, and um, I guess have the kind of legal protections, even if individuals um, misgender you. And so I think there's, there's clearly a, a lot to be gained where state structures reinforce the identities of trans people. Um, I think um, the question of what might get lost or distorted where um, state and institutional structures name trans individuals in the names that they name themselves or in the ways that they name them they, that they name themselves is a bit more difficult for me to kind of discern i can kind of immediately only think of the ways that it could work and and might leave it to gloriana to to pick out some of those additional nuances fabulous thank you uh what is i think you you started it on a very good note and uh yeah thanks uh, uh, gloriana over to you now Well, I have to agree with a lot of um, what you said. I, you know, off the top of my head, you know, what is lost when the state intervenes? Sorry, it, it went off. Um, so the state, by by definition, it's going to be more conservative. It's going to be slow. It tends to, you know, be bulky in the in catching up with these things. So when the state is naming transgender individuals or these other identities, even if it is to establish them, let's say as a protected group, it's not going to encompass the diversity of the movement. I think the transgender community, like other communities, is very heterogeneous. But uh, the state, when it's establishing public policies that are supposed to be national, um, tends to be simplistic. So that's one thing that's lost. It won't fully understand the scope, the diversity, and the beauty of that diversity. The state can't, does not appreciate it. So when you look at the public policies, when you look at the laws, by definition, they're going to be more restricted. They're going to box in these identities, which has its 
own series of problems. And I think I'm talking about gender identities, but we can be talking about any other identity. And that can be problematic when it says, this is a group we're going to protect, but then it establishes a little bit of a box. Um, and moreover, in addition to maybe not acknowledging the diversity, there tends to be a privileging of the dominant voices, i.e. the case of Honduras, more urban, more middle class voices, because um, since those voices, although marginal, because of their proximity to power, they may be a little bit easier for the state to hear than maybe a voice that comes from a more rural area, a voice that is from a member of the transgender community that is dealing with trip with three types or four types of marginalization. So it's not going to acknowledge that diversity and the protection is going to be awarded first to the more powerful members of the community. That is something that I think can be problematic and it's why you can never rest <laughs> as an activist. You know, you always have to be, you always have to keep one eye open because you're always going to be have to contesting the state and you're always going to be challenging uh, human rights. Um, as one of my mentors said, remember human rights are not written in stone, they're written in the sand and at any time the high tide will come. So you always have to be very vigilant. Um, that being said, I have to agree that there is, I, in spite of all its flaws, its imperfections, for me, it still is very exciting to hear, to see the state, to bear witness to the state acknowledging these identities. And again, here we have to bear in mind that the law is not neutral and the state is not neutral. Uh, as we've seen with transgender rights, the state and the law have been have been instruments for the hegemonic groups to institutionalize their cruelty, to exclude social groups like the transgender community. So even that paradigm shift from institutional cruelty to institutional perfection, albeit an imperfect problematic pro uh, protection, that's something to celebrate from cruelty pr to protection. And this idea that the social contract, you know, this the state protecting the common good is going to include some of the groups that have been excluded, some of the groups that have been erased, it's going to say, no, 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 you get to be part of this picture. Um, I, it's still something we have to celebrate. So I, I say, let's celebrate our imperfect victories with enthusiasm, bearing in mind, we still have to wake up tomorrow and continue fighting. Fabulous. Now, I think all the other comments are very complimentary. Many, many comments from almost everyone, you know, um, Shuvai has additional ones, Munya, um, Eka, um, Ahmed, you know, all those, uh, Natasha, everyone. Um, uh, yeah, there are two points that I'll probably uh, um, throw to you to comment on, and that could also be our closing remarks, because I know we have just about 10 minutes more. Um, and I'm going to combine two questions. One of them was talking about um, that beyond colonialism as a cause and religion as a challenge, um, how else can we deal with some of these hate crimes? So if, yeah, of course, colonialism plays a part, religion plays a part. How do we deal with that? Um, to combine this question with someone else's question, which came from an anonymous person, he's asking what social in initiatives or legal policies could be implemented to effectively address and prevent um, transfemicide. So basically, your forward-looking reflections going forward are around policy and practice. And then that could be um, and that could be our concluding remarks from either both of you or one of you. In case you want us to give you want to give any social initiatives or illegal policies. Um, who wants to start first? Might be for Gloria to start first. Sure. So you want me to start first. Okay. So um first uh, with the colonial element, I want to I want to make a point of saying I always I think it's very important to understand the history and the context of both of any social injustice. And I think a lot of times the modern day discourse regarding LGBTQ rights is written as if it was this contemporary phenomenon. Um, and then it's, there's this, uh, the narrative is that the global North has this advancement and now they're coming to teach the global South uh, how to promote LGBTQ rights. And this is a narrative that I reject. Um, I think it's very important to position, to understand where transphobia comes from, where homophobia comes from, 
how these social injustices emerged in each given society. And it's and the story is going to be different in Honduras, in Guatemala, uh, versus you know, Zimbabwe versus Italy, depending on what country we're talking about. Um, I do think it's important to understand the role of colonialism, also because a lot of the discussion today is that not only is this something new, but that this is something natural. So the gender binary is something natural. Heterosexuality is something natural. When in reality, both the gender binary and heterosexuality are socially constructed. These are social constructs that have been passed off as acceptable because of a very violent process that happened over centuries. So I think that's why I always make a point of mentioning that like, we have to understand the roots of this injustice. Um, and that brings me to the point with social initiatives. Uh, part of it, I think, is understanding the true history of transgender, gender diverse, and the LGBT community more broadly. Understanding that this isn't a new group. <laughs> these aren't new social actors. These are social actors that have always been with us, that they may have been erased or for their own survival, they may have led clandestine lives over the past few centuries. Um, and the other thing I would say is it is very important to have public policies that both acknowledge uh, these could the existence of these communities. And uh, this is something I mentioned in the article. I do think it is important to have hate crimes on the book and to say, you know what, if you if you use certain terms, if you have certain actions, if you target someone because of an identity, that is a hate crime. Um, one of my biggest critiques is that when you look at the legal briefs of the trial of Vicky Hernandez held within the national jurisdiction, her transgender identity wasn't mentioned. The fact that she was killed because she was a trans woman wasn't even mentioned. So I think it's very important to not only understand the history of gender diverse, transgender and LGBTQI individuals, to understand the history of that violence and then to take measures to address that violence and to punish that violence when it does occur. Um, so yeah, that, that's what I would say. And, and sorry, just to end on a more positive note, it's we have to understand that history so that we can write a new chapter, hopefully not one based on violence, but one based on inclusion and celebration. Hmm. Uh, that's fabulous. So understand the history, let's write a new chapter. Uh, let's decolonize, let's humanize. Thank you. Um, what is that? Do you have any closing comments in response to anything at all or uh, to add up to what uh, uh, Gloriana said? Hmm, I think, I think mine might just be to again touch on um, the kind of diversity of, of instances of resistance um, and what Gloriana mentioned about joy as, a, as, a, as one of the most compelling forms of resistance. Um, and I think both to, to include it as, as, a, as a, key a, a key tool in that act activist toolbox that Gloriana kind of mentioned, um, amplifying instances and the visibility of um, LGBTQ plus trans joy, um, seeking that out, I think always a reminder that the lives of um, LGBTQ plus and trans people are more than just the kind of ways that the oppression of these um, marginalized and vulnerable groups is visible. Um, and so kind of more, more queer trans joy, wherever we can find it. Um, and as a kind of solve to the to the heaviness of the activist pursuit that as Gloriana mentioned needs to remain ongoing and will need yeah will will remain ongoing um and and really cannot stop um yeah so those are my my closing thoughts fabulous thank you so much and um i know we asked for one and a half hours and that's what we are going to take today um, we have four more minutes, so um, I'll use that to just uh, wrap up, and then we can call it a very, very good and productive day. Um, yeah, obviously, um, this our thirteenth research seminar has you know highlighted another key, um, a key part of uh, social, socio political ecosystem in, in in the global south. And I like the point you made, um, Gloriana, and in, in fact, uh, when they said everyone else, that we should look at, um, you know, LGBTQ plus community activism, not as um, 
a salvation being brought to the global south by the north, but something that has always been um, with society, it has a natural um, occurrence and that it's not a new human right being championed by saviors of the north, but you know, part of community. We just need to decolonize that whole concept and also um, look at the you know, LGBTQ community as hum part, complete human beings who should have identity that's complete, you know, whether male, female, in the middle, anything in between, but at least people should be identified as who they are and want to be. Um, the law could play a part, and I think I cannot overemphasize that point. Um, the state has a role to play um, when the state uses its power to trample upon the liberties of individuals, then it's a problem. And that's where transnational institutions could play a part. But like we've said already, that could be in itself a challenge because not all transnational institutions are credible or potent to deal with anything at all. Um, the AU has been cited, but of course, AU has its own advantages and um, disadvantages. But um, yeah, so look, th this has been very enriching and thanks so much, um, Gloriana, for agreeing to, to do this, to share that very insightful paper with us. Um, and thanks very much with, with Deza as well for um, giving that thorough reflection on, on the presentation and adding your own thoughts. Thank you everyone who came today uh, for asking questions, engaging, making contributions and adding, you know, perspectives to the whole conversation, which, which, which I think has enriched the conversation even beyond what we envisaged. As always, this platform has been provided by the African Leadership Center of King's College London. And um, please tune in next month. Uh, I think we have another, um, another session coming up, um, which will be advertised soon. I think if I'm not mistaken, it's gonna be about um, Barney's book launch. Um, and we'll be sharing that with you in the, in the coming weeks. So please stay tuned and join us again next month or whenever we, uh, we position the time. And hopefully that time will be in the afternoon. Uh, it looks like this evening time is not that bad. We'll see how it goes. But yeah, um, thanks so much and do have a good time. Unless there's any other point anyone wants to raise, I think we can call it a very, very good day. So thank you. Have a good one. Bye-bye.